Coming up on the Unusable Podcast. Annoying notification sounds. Vacuum cleaners designed to be loud. And Andy bum shuffling on a water slide. Like a dog with worms. (laughs) Hello and welcome to the Unusable Podcast where we discuss the importance of user experience in technology and the world around us and talk about great design that just works or moan about it when it doesn't. Hi, David. Uh, hi, Andy. Everything all right? Yeah, not bad. Should we do our little intros? Yeah, go on. Okay, so I am Andrew Waite, and I am the product owner of a SaaS product in Derby. Good. <laughs> I'm David Ball, my front-end web and app developer. Boring stuff out the way. Let's okay. get down to business. Okay, what are we talking about? Um, recently, I watched a video on YouTube, which gave me an inspiration for the topic of this podcast. Yeah. And it's a video by a channel called Cheddar, which is really good, actually. They do these kind of sort of documentary kind of really slightly produced videos. Is it always about topics. cheese? No. <laughs> no, it's just about the world around us and interesting topics. And they did okay. one recently about, the title of it is that something along the lines of why vacuum cleaners are so loud when they don't need to be. Right, okay. Like um, but the whole topic is basically about sound design and how sound influences user experience. And it's something that I don't think we've talked about yet on our podcasts. Okay. So, sound design is definitely a thing. So I, th- I thought we should sort of talk about a little bit about the video and the sort of things that they cover and sort of add our own little um, spin on it, as it were, and talk about, yeah, just generally sound in, in UX, because I think it's quite important. Yeah. So vacuum cleaners don't have to be as loud as they are. Is that right? That is what the video said so basically vacuum cleaners can be a lot quieter but people don't feel like it's picking up dirt unless it's loud and makes a noise as the dirt travels up the the pipe oh right okay so you know when you vacuum cleaning there's that kind of like rattle of the dirt going up the hose yeah it's quite satisfying yeah a certain degree of that is engineered in oh right and 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 sound design is actually sometimes accidental but often sound design is actually intentional right and and there's huge teams in car manufacturers that design the way the cars are going to sound not just in terms of the engine noise but in terms of even just when the door closes what sort of clunk it makes or when you flick on the indicator switch what sort of click that that makes they they spend a lot of time making sure it sounds like you know true to the brand gives the right feedback but just closing the car door that's not that doesn't seem very important you say that but i think it can give a real sense of perception of quality if it makes a satisfying thud yeah i'm sure you've been in a cheap car before where you close the door and it just sounds like a bean can just feels like plasticky and rubbish yeah, yeah. so so that, yeah it doesn't so feel quality this is just my personal opinion but i think volkswagen are very good at that they're not necessarily being good quality but having a really high perceived quality so like making things out of quality materials that feel nice and having a satisfying click to the buttons and having everything sound nice when you touch it or close the door okay but we're not talking about touch we're talking about no sound but right i'm now. just yeah so talk about the, the buttons you said about the, the satisfying click of a button is that purposeful I, oftentimes, yeah. If you think about a tactile button and the ta- and, and getting that feedback, that can include a click. Think about flicking a light switch on in a in a house. Yeah, you get that satisfying click. As you it know that it's place. you know it's on when you hear the click. Yeah, you don't even have to look at it. And whether it was initially intentional or not, I think to design a light switch now that doesn't have that satisfying click would almost be weird for users. I think it would be jarring for me. I know if I walked into a room and pressed the light switch and it clicked into place under my fingers but didn't actually make the clicking sound. I'd find that incredibly jarring. Yeah, you're right. And this comes around to a thing that they they talk about in the video, which is that people love quietness and that can be a really good selling point in a product, but actually satisfying feedback trumps quietness. Okay. So in that case, you could make a silent light switch, you could make a silent vacuum cleaner, but knowing that it's working is really a really important part of the user experience. Hearing that click as it engages, hearing the dirt go up the pipe of the vacuum, those are really important pieces of user feedback that signify that it's, it's doing what it's supposed to be doing so are these things faked then so thinking about the the vacuum cleaner again so mm-hmm. you've got two vacuum cleaners one has been engineered to be really super quiet and the other one's just normal it's loud and when you suck dirt up it sort of goes clunk 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 up the tube and stuff like that are you saying that the, the really loud one is going to sell more than the quiet one because people are going to be trying out the quiet one and going oh i don't think it's working uh, apparently that's what research shows and I, I it sounds more than plausible to me like if i went into a shop and was to try out different vacuum cleaners. Maybe they've got some kind of test setup where you can hoover up some rice or something like that. That happens, right? Where's this? Where's this test centre for vacuum cleaners? Have you never been 
into like a like an electronics shop and I've been into electronics shops, but they never ever get the vacuum cleaners out and go, oh, have a have a try. No, I've definitely been in one where you can like try the suction out on them all, and they're all actually working. And really, yeah, where's this magical shop? Curry's. Curry's. <laughs> Doesn't even exist anymore. Is this it called is Curry's? It's called Curry still. Curry's is it? PC World, yeah. All right, fine. Sorry, I thought that they went bankrupt. So you're thinking of Comet? Oh uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, or Dixon's. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, you know, and also if you're telling someone about how good it is, I, mean, I think a lot of things are bought on recommend. Our vacuum cleaner we bought on recommendation yeah. from a friend, and yeah, I think that's a really important part of it. That sort of noise of dirt being sucked up, and the yeah, the noise of air rushing, and I think that's all all really po- important part of the experience. Okay, but we're talking about design now. Obviously, by accident, you could create a vacuum cleaner that you can hear the dust. But how is that being designed? How is that purposeful? How has somebody at the company gone? Ooh, I know what we need to make a new vacuum cleaner but it needs to be as noisy as possible so that people love it I don't think as noisy as possible is right I think it needs to it needs to sound like it's working is the important part so what they're going to do is they're going to firstly get the the suction right so it actually does pick stuff up but then you know in designing the the shape of the tubes the material the tubes are made from you know I'm not a vacuum clean cleaner maker but I would assume you could make the tube that you know the tube what what do you even call it the wand the wand what the I don't know. It's not Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Potter's making all vacuum cleaners. <laughs> Cleanius expellius. <laughs> Whatever you call it, the long tube, you could make that out of a multitude of different things, right? You could make it out of steel, you could make it out of some kind of plastic. And I assume plastic would be quieter. Yeah. Because the dirt's not going to rattle up it as quite as loudly. Is this why I've never got got on with Dyson's? Oh no, Dyson's are made out of metal, aren't they? Yeah, why don't you like it Dyson? Too faffy. Really? The, too, the, too complicated. The, the one product I... So I don't like Dyson's regular vacuums, but the one product I absolutely love from Dyson is their cordless vacuum. I think it's really good. Are Dyson's made out of metal? Is the yeah. metal? Yeah, it is, yeah. Okay, yeah. fine. But you also have that cylinder bit in it where all the dirt sort of whizzes around and you can see it. Oh, uh, that's another thing I don't like it. I don't want to see the dirt that I just picked up. No, but I do. I want that satisfaction of being able to see, yes, that dirt that was on the floor is now not on the floor. It's in this container whizzing round. Gross thing that you can look at. Yeah. Why it... can't you put it in a, in a nice little bag? Well, like an, well, an older vacuum, we, we actually yeah. have. Um... And then and then when, you, when you're ready to chuck it out, just take the bag out, pop that in the bin. But With I... the Dyson, what you've got to do is hold it over the bin, shake it, and all the dust comes out and goes in your face. You are really surprising me at hearing. What? I don't so, want to interact with my dust. Versus having a bag, having the clear cylinder on a on a Dyson handheld, you can see the dirt level, so you know when you need to empty it. Gross. You don't need to replace the bag and buy bags from a shop and go out and get them. Yeah, okay, that is something it. that I do like the sound of. And you can get that satisfaction of the dirt with your hand. Like, to me, that's a big usability win. All right, fine. But this is about sound, not about vacuum cleaners. Correct. correct. Okay, so tell me more about sound. So the video goes into the saying that, that sounds are used for three different reasons. So for feedback, which obviously we've covered, it's that rattling sound to let you know it's working or the yeah. click of the light switch. Yeah. For branding, which I find quite interesting. Yeah, okay. For example, the they literally have it in their t- slogan for Pringles. Once you pop, you can't stop. So that pop of the lid. Pringles the crisps, yeah. Yeah, and then the crunch of the actual Pringle itself. Yeah, okay. Um, apparently, I don't, I don't know if this is true, but the design, you know that shape of a Pringle? I think yeah. it's called parabolic. is designed to give the maximum amount of crunch and make the maximum amount of noise. Yeah, because if you were to ever eat a crisp... Or potato chip for our American listeners, um, that's kind of soggy, that doesn't have the crunch. You think, ooh, it's like really old and a bit gross. Yeah, again. But the sa- crunch means that it's in, sort of fresh. Yeah, in the design of that product, the sound is super important. Yeah, okay. So, but that that can't have been engineered. Oh, I suppose if the shape, they're all created to be the same shape. So, yeah, that has been engineered. Yeah. Okay. And the pop of the lid as well. That's no accident. You know, the way that the plastic tube and you flick off the plastic lid and it goes. Yeah. And once you pop, you can't stop. It's literally part of their slogan. Yeah. Which came first? Um, who knows? But so many things are like that, right? In branding. Okay, this this isn't sound, but one thing that always strikes me is the distinctive smell of Subway, the sandwich shop. Right. It has a really particular smell, which forms, I believe, a strong part of its brand. That's not sound. No, but people often think of a brand as just a colour scheme or a logo or a font, right? It's all visual. Yeah. Forgetting that actually important parts of brands, like with Pringles, is the pop noise. Or with Subway, the, the smell as you walk in, that kind of bready 
but it's really distinctive. Like it's not like the same as any other bread. It's like a really distinctive smell that you get in in a subway. Mm, yeah. The last category that they give you in the video, yeah, of what sounds for is for behavioural. Right. And the example they give is again Pringles. So that that crunch makes you want more of them. So the crunchy noise is encouraging you to do more. Or think about the way a, a notification pop on your phone causes yeah. a behavioural reaction, doesn't it? It causes you to look at your phone. Of course, yeah. Another place where sound is really important, and also it's a good illustration of something that really doesn't need to be, but it's become convention, and it's it's really important to users to get the feedback, is when you are at the supermarket and you are checking out, either using a self-checkout or the operator is doing it, the boop. Oh, right. Boop. As, as you as you scan an item across the scanner, like, there's no reason for it to make that noise. It's purely a, a registering, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a feedback, isn't it? Well, there it? is a reason, yeah. The, the reason is the feedback, so that you know that it's, it's been scanned. And if you, if you were to accidentally do it twice, you would know. Correct. Or if you were to miss it, So it's a know. really important part of the experience. But what I'm saying more than that is there's no reason it's that specific beep, but yet it always is. Oh, right. It could be and anything. It could be like the sound of a ka Yeah, it could be a tiger's roar. People could give you the choice on a, on a checkout of which which noise do you want? Like, you know, like ringtones from the 90s when it suddenly people could have whatever they wanted and people were having ridiculous things. It would make the supermarket sound like a jungle. <laughs> <laughs> Every checkout had a different animal. Yeah. It's like tiger's roar. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> oh, that's checkout number five. That's the monkey checkout. <laughs> I suppose there is no reason that you need... A unique sound on each checkout. No. But I do have a good example of unique sounds. So I listened to the podcast 99% Invisible and they had a two-parter about, about sound. One of the things that they talked about was a subway or train in Japan. And they played a little jingle for every station that it stopped at. Oh, right. And the jingle was unique to each station. Oh, and it was that's just so cool. And so you could tell where you are just by playing this little jingle. And I assume you could look out and see the sign as well or they would probably tell you which station it is, but for the people who are on that journey every day, they could always just just zone out but they know when they hear that special signature sound exactly yeah yeah and you know where you are without having to really pay much uh, attention to it that's quite interesting actually but i wonder how much variation in noise in sounds they have to you know how many different you know how many subway stations are there well how many songs are there in the world all of them no, of unique. course, but some songs sound quite like others and are easily mistaken for others. Like, in order for that to really work, you need to have enough different combinations that one can't be mistaken for the other. True. And True. the other thing is, it could get quite interesting there because what you could do is if you've got, if you were able to say how, or put some sort of number around how similar certain ones are or how far apart they are, you could make sure that the most similar sounds are on a far furthest apart on the network. Oh my God, you're getting complicated if you were, now. But if you if you have a subway network, right, if you've got a network of train lines and things like that, you could say the most different sounds have to be close together so that like stations close together can be differentiated. But maybe on different lines, we can have similar sounds and we don't need to worry about it. So if you're much. going that complicated, you could just use the sound, which is the name. Well, I was going to say the easy, the easiest thing here, surely, like in a lot, what a lot of trains do. I've been on trains that do this where you get close and it goes the next stop will be Charing Cross. Yeah, but it's always a little muffled and just. Whereas if you play a little jingle, kind of nice, you can sort of. Like... Yeah, and also I wonder. This is purely. This is not based upon any evidence. I wonder if actually, if you are zoned out, that the words just blur into one, whereas a unique jingle is somehow more identifiable. I, I don't know. But yeah. I'm, I'm guessing some research either has been done or could be done into that and find out what. Also, they're branding a place. Yeah, true. So we're kind of talking about audio branding. Yep. So have you ever thought about little adverts on TV where they have a little a little bit of a jingle and then you associate that with the product? Yeah. If you think about the first Absolutely. the first one I ever heard was Intel. Where yeah. it goes, Intel. Duh, 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 duh. No, you missed a note out. It's oh. do, 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 do. There's that first bit. You missed that out. All oh, right. Okay. Well, yeah. obviously it's not worked on me. <laughs> The worst ones for that, though, is like local radio. Local radio jingles are amazing. I, mean, I thought you were going to say awful or amazingly awful. No, the, amazingly awful. All right, okay. Definitely amazingly awful. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, uh, but does it matter? Could it be terrible but still distinctive? You know, memorable? Yeah, it's an earworm, isn't it? It's, it's getting inside your head. And sometimes I can just be in 
I can't think of any now because I'm trying to think of them, but sometimes I can just be <laughs> in the middle of like something totally irrelevant and suddenly a jingle from years ago for a business that doesn't even exist anymore that used to be played on the radio will just come into my head because it's just somehow implanted itself in there. So it's so effective that it's got into your brain, but completely pointless because you can't buy from that company anymore. Because <laughs> it's, yeah, it's so old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the one that sticks in mind is Ashbourne Taxis. Never even lived in Ashbourne. Irrelevant. Can you sing it for us, though? It's something like Ashbourne Taxis, 342198. Ashbourne Taxis. Yeah. Call them up. <laughs> I've probably got the number totally wrong. That's the tune. Yeah. The, not the right numbers, I don't think, but that's the tune. Do not call that number. It might call someone's grandma. Yeah. Okay, another example of audio branding, sort of, mm-hmm. um, but it's related to what you were talking about before. Harley Davidson, the sound of their motorbikes are so unique that yeah. you can tell it's a Harley Davidson. I'm getting this from that video that you, that you showed me. That's true. Quite a lot of things, though, and you think about like a lot of um, cars, like the Subaru as well, has a really distinctive engine sound. Okay, which I'm not sure if that's by intentional sound design or just accidentally how they sound. But, but is this branding? Is this is this branding or is this just the product being unique? I think I think oftentimes, like with Harley Davidson, I strongly believe that that was like retrospective branding. So they made a motorcycle that sounded like that and then they became well known for that. And then that then became their brand accidentally. And now they almost can't move away from it. But it's, it's kind of an asset anyway. It's... So what, even if they were to make a new motorcycle with a completely different engine, completely redesign everything, they'd still have to make it sound like the old ones just so that you know that it's the same yeah brand. definitely definitely even if they went say i don't know electric electric motorcycle it still has to go well that's an interesting um an interesting topic that well let's talk about it then well because because electric cars nowadays people people associate the noise of a car engine with power and performance if you know the louder it is the deeper it is the rumblier it, it is the more annoying it is well yeah <laughs> um they, they associate that with power and performance and you know excitement or a lot of people do maybe not everyone whereas tesla obviously has really booked that trend and the cars are virtually silent and yet they go faster than almost all petrol right. fossil fuel powered cars that there are so what do they do have they got a sound well i mean that's the like question an artificial sound do you play in fake sound does it just take time for people to adapt the, the other aspect and facet to this as well is pedestrian safety so a kind of happy side effect of a fossil fueled car with an engine is that it usually makes enough noise that someone can hear it coming if they're about to cross the road they'll hear yeah you know a combination of the tire noise the engine noise the exhaust noise all these different sounds and can hear it coming whereas with a tesla the engine noise being missing and the exhaust noise being missing suddenly makes it very quiet and potentially dangerous in a pedestrian uh, especially because it's so such a fast car as well potentially quite dangerous in in, in that regard okay because you just don't you won't hear it coming on that podcast I was listening to, they had a guy talking about how he was creating some concepts of sounds added to electric cars for, I think it was Nissan. And so they wanted to make sure that it was always going to be on brand. But because they were completely starting blank slates, these new cars, these new electric cars, didn't have to sound like other cars. But also they do sort of have to sound like cars because if they sound like a chirping frog, then people are just going to be really confused. Yeah. So is this in terms of like the pedestrians being aware of it or is this in terms of the driver getting some excitement? Or... I think the pedestrians being aware of it, but you can get the noise sort of pumped into the into the cockpit of car. Cockpit? Is that right? Into the, yeah. the inside so, the car as well. So my car that I've just bought does this. Okay. What does it do? So it has like a fake noise generator. <laughs> And you can choose in the settings whether you want it to be off, sort of a little bit of fake noise or a lot of fake noise. Oh, right. Okay. And it makes quite a big difference. Can you choose like the type of engine? Like, Could you make your car sound like a Harley mm. Davidson motorbike or something? No. Well, not in not in my car because it's it's more like, you know, like a vibration motor in a in a phone. It just creates like a rumble, but if you know what I mean. Oh, right. So it's not, it's not a like a speaker. It's not a speaker. It's not a, a synthesized noise. It's like a... It is a synthesized noise, but it's it's from a, like a physical rumble, not played just through a speaker. But there is a car that allows you allows you to do that. I ha- there's I think it's a Renault Clio Renault Sport. Right. You can choose on the car stereo other cars from history that you want your car to sound like. <laughs> like what? So you can choose like oh my car sounds like a Nissan GTR or a old fashioned Renault sports car or whatever, and so you can yeah you can have it played into the into the cabin through the speakers. Model T. 
No. I think, well, it's Renault, so it has to be something within there. Oh, right, okay. It's, like, it's not... You can't choose from every car in history, then? No, just what they have copyright for, or what they have the rights to... Horse and carts? Can you make it sound like a horse and carts? Uh, I guess so. <laughs> That's, that sounds a bit like a Tesla sort of thing, doesn't it? Like, they know. have all the Easter eggs and stuff in, don't they? What you're saying about branding? Yeah. Have you ever noticed the different notification tones on your phone for different apps? Yes, they'll all have a similar but different type, won't they? So yeah. You can tell. So again, that's a way... Well, that those tones are obviously to kind of elicit some behaviour. Yeah. But they're also on brand, right? If One of the most distinctive ones I've noticed on my phone is the eBay app. If I get a notification about some kind of... Well, anything like um, a bid on an item or something I've bought has been shipped. It's really distinctive. And I know instantly without even having to look at my phone. That that's, eBay. that's eBay telling me that information. Could you could you do a demonstration for us? Can I what, try and get eBay to send me a notification? No, no, no. Use your mouth. Oh, God, no. <laughs> I think isn't it like a isn't it like a ka-ching, I think. Oh right, okay. Well, so like if you've made a sale, that makes that, sense. That ka-ching. I, I just remember not necessarily what the sound is, but how distinctive it is, and how when it happens, I know that it's eBay. Yeah. But other apps are the same. Like, have you ever noticed on Facebook Messenger how you get like a little click when a message has been sent? Yes, so that you know that it's gone. But that's a lovely little bit of feedback and that, you know, you don't have to look at your phone to get. It's quite nice that it's not visual. The most obvious example I can think of is on uh, Mac Mail when you send an email, it goes as if it's like rocketing. Flown off. Flown off, yeah. Yeah. Have you ever played a computer game without any sound? Because it's not the same experience. It feels weird and it makes you realise how much you rely on sound to give you like the, the feeling of quality and the feedback and everything like that that's that, that you kind of you expect from a game that you're fully immersed in yes it is definitely an important sense well i, I you know i play a lot of um racing games yeah. on my xbox and my uh, for some reason my xbox went weird the other day and stopped making sound and that was really difficult because in the car you need to know when to change gear right and you use the audio feedback of the engine oh yeah of course in order to know when to change gear and so i was in the middle of this online race so i can't pause it i can't start yeah. It's online and the sound cuts out. And so I don't know when to change gear. I have to start looking, taking my eyes off the road and trying to look at the rev meter to say, oh, I need to change up gear and now down oh, right, gear. Yeah. It totally lost the experience. Like you said, it just, yeah, I, I couldn't even drive as quickly as I could normally. I was like dropping places in the online race. Hugely important part of the experience. There's a 99% Invisible uh, podcast about sound in hospitals and specifically yeah. like the notification and alarm sort of sounds. Yeah. So in hospitals, which are places where people want to get better and relax, which is an important part of, of getting better and recovering, sometimes they're very, very noisy places because you've got people talking, people talking over each other, alarms going off. So all these like beeping I was going to say, things. actually, people trying to rest and recuperate and like you said, like get better that's oh, it's the of... worst place for it in a hospital but, yeah. when you've got alarms going off well it's kind of at odds with um an alarm that's designed to tell a nurse that someone's just about to keel over or something yeah the, those two things are very much at odds aren't they yeah and there's some of these some of these equipment they all have different sounds and they've been designed the sounds have been designed to be the sort of sound that cuts above and through everything else so that you but can really right. really hear but that's it. right because if a machine that is keeping someone alive needs to tell someone that it's either failing or the person is their condition is worsening whatever it is that alarm needs to attract any and all attention it can it does however when you've got so many alarms all going off at the same time different pieces of equipment or maybe in different rooms but but you can hear in close proximity you get this kind of alarm fatigue and yeah. so people have said about that they have this so doctors nurses have said that there's so many alarms going off all the time that you just kind of cancel it out in your brain so really the alarm is kind of pointless it's just it's just annoying yeah and really it's not serving the purpose that it's supposed to yeah i think a lot of things are in danger of that the assumption is we need to have as many alerts as possible because we need to tell people about it and then we're covering you know, every eventuality, but actually it just becomes annoying and people block it out and it becomes yeah. the norm. It just becomes like this this wall of noise because when these pieces of equipment are all created, they're created individually and they're not, I assume, not thought of in the context of a hospital where you've got lots of different alarms going off all at the same time. And so you've got all of these really piercing noises yeah. that it's just a big wall of sound 
you can't actually distinguish one alarm from another. Yeah. And so actually it's not serving the purpose that it was intended for. And apparently it's a big deal in hospitals that a lot of people have actually died because the alarm was going off, but nobody was responding to it. Or maybe it was too complicated because individual pieces of technology might have different alarm tones or notes or sounds, different types of alarms, but it might not always be obvious what each one means. Yeah. So each one of those has been designed, which is great, but the person who they're being designed for might not necessarily have been trained to what all those things mean. Okay, can I tell you about our new Twitter followers? Well, you normally do. Okay, people who have followed us recently are Steve Krieger... Hi, Steve Prigger. Alicia Ranjit. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I realised it's going to take me far too long to say everyone's name. Elizabeth Chesters. Hi. Joan Alba Moldano. Hi. Jake Hobbs. Hi. Owen Ree. Hi. Andy Owen. Hi. James Nguyen. Nguyen. James Nguyen. Hi. Gatika Johnson. Hi. Casey Taylor. Hi. Alice Kay. Hi. Marcus Rios. Hi. Esther Fernandez. Hi. And Catherine Hills. Hi. Hello, everyone. Also, we had a tweet from Sarah Bundernettini, who has been listening to us while she was on vacation oh. on the beach. I am not jealous whatsoever. Yeah, but just think, somebody was li- somebody was on a beach listening to us. That is what they chose to listen to in a idyllic what? location. Who, who was that? What were they thinking? This is Sarah Bunden, uh, Bundernettini. Sarah, what are you thinking? Why? why? <laughs> is that? I, it made me think. Is this the most exotic location that we've been listened to? Probably. Okay. All right. I'm not you... sure why. I, I wouldn't listen to me on a drizzly Monday morning on the way into work, <laughs> let alone sat on a beach. Neither would anyone else. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what I want is that if somebody has listened to us in a more exotic location than, uh, hang on, where was it? She was in Valencia, on the beach oh, in Valencia. Oh, Valencia's beautiful. All right, place. okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, tell us where you're listening and uh, we'll see if we can have any improvements on that. Now, back to the main topic of conversation. So, as well as being really helpful in getting across a brand, making people do things in a certain way or giving feedback, sounds also can be quite annoying, right? Mm-hmm. Especially, like, notifications on your phone and, and, and things, technology, or like we said about the, the beeping of the hospitals. Well, I always think about, for annoying sound, there's an old episode of QI right. where Stephen Fry is talking about how rude a telephone is, really, when you think about it. Why, what? Well... Oh, telephone, the, the ringtone. If you phone someone, yeah, that noise going off is basically akin to someone... It, it interrupts whatever you're doing, right? Yeah. But that's, it, what, that's the intention. That's what it's for. Of course. But, it's, but would you, in any other... Without that telephone, do the same? thing would you go up to someone and go speak to me now 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 that's <laughs> that's essentially what a phone does right when when, it, when someone's phone rings it's a it's quite an impatient interruption in your day yeah okay and i i personally find phones quite annoying and i often ignore phone calls just because i can't i'm you know i've, I've usually got a lot on i'm busy i don't want to deal with it right there and then when it's convenient for someone else i want to deal with it when it's convenient for me yeah mine's on silent all the time but it makes me feel bad sometimes because sometimes it's like a friend ringing and I do want to speak to them, but it's just like so inconvenient when they're phoning. Yeah. And so I'll just ignore I it. I think and that's okay. Back. It's not always the most convenient time. You think that's okay? I always feel rude doing it. Well. Because it, it is doing that. It's basically going, speak to me now, speak to me now, speak to me now. Right, feel, yeah, we yeah. get it. We get it. Yeah. Speaking of most annoying sounds. <laughs> 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 we should release that as a, as a ringtone. People can... Uh... They'll definitely answer it just to shut you up. Yeah, true. Any other annoying sounds? I mean, I, I can think of a couple of annoying sounds in our office that that wind me up. If you're on a phone call or something and it happens at the wrong time. So the coffee machine and the printer, when they're turning on. Oh, right, yeah. Go through some ridiculous mechanical procedure which generates so much noise of like motors and grinding and gears and i don't know what quite why they have to do that but if if you're in the office at the wrong time um, and you're on the phone that's when you notice it i suppose is when you're on the phone and that's i think when you notice how noisy a normal office environment actually is because if you've got loads of computers on all the time you've got people talking even if they're just talking quietly and you've got the air con on you've got the rumble of the sound uh, the road outside you've got people walking around maybe on the floor above maybe the floor below Things like that, doors slamming, stuff like that, people on the phone. That can be actually very, very loud. And that can make an office environment quite a stressful 
place without even really thinking about it because your brain yeah. is cancelling out those sort of mundane sounds. Yeah, but I think it's quite important, right? Sound design. People often, again, when designing art- architectural spaces, forget the importance of sound design and acoustics as to how a space feels and how humans interact and occupy that space and how they feel in that space. But it's really important. <laughs> So apparently Finland is one of the happiest places in the, in the world. And in the railway stations, they've designed them specifically to sort of disperse the, the noise. Now, I think a lot of their trains are electric anyway, uh, so they're not as loud as like big diesel engine trains like we've got outside at the minute making lots of noise, which is annoying. And so, yeah, they've designed thinking of these acoustics and so that it doesn't make a lot of noise. Yeah. Which you can do. Yeah. And so, some places do, some places don't. I think it depends on, I don't know, probably like budget and stuff but it's a difficult thing to kind of quantify you can't really say that people will be happier but people will definitely be more annoyed if they can hear lots of sound especially engine sounds yeah it's just not nice is it so about that i've noticed so it's about an hour and a half i would say from where we are in the uk to london on a train all right good and i've noticed a significant difference on how relaxed and refreshed i feel when i get to london based upon the type of train that takes me there right so there's two types of train that they run from derby to to london yeah there's one that has the older type that has the engine at the front and the back Mm -hmm. i made a mistake bring us on to the topic of trains are you just going to talk about trains for ages possibly right possibly but no yeah so speak fast there's the one type of train where the engines are at the front and the back and the carriage in the middle are whisper quiet and you feel you arrive in London, you know, if you're going for work or for a meeting or something, you feel quite refreshed. Okay. The more modern trains have an engine in each carriage, essentially, under the floor. Oh, so it's a lot more noisy. And so the, the rumbling and the noise and the it all comes, resonates through the whole carriage. Right. And so you end up arriving in London having had like an hour and a half's worth of diesel engine noise. Oh, right. Okay. Um, And it, I personally definitely noticed the difference in how I feel when I get off that train at the other end. Oh, right, okay. Could we bring back like steam engines? Were they less noisy? If you were, if you were quite far back in the train, then yeah, because the the noise is all at the front, right? It's yeah. it's all not the front right at the front. Right. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that you, you're making the noise as far away from where the people are as possible, which is great. On the podcast that I was listening to about the sounds of alarms in hospitals, they said that not all alarms have to be really loud and really piercing. Because if you think about it, if you hear a scream, you know, a human scream in the distance, it doesn't have to be very loud. It can have to be quite quiet, but it's the it's the exact frequency that makes you it, yeah. go, it goes right into it goes right to your brain. Yeah. With that theory, you don't have to make every alarm really loud and shouting and stuff like that. It's more about the sound and the frequency than it is about the the volume. Yeah. But I, I know exactly what you mean by that because so so we've got a, a a little girl who when she's in bed sometimes cries and we have to go and comfort her. We can have the the baby monitor that allows us to hear her quite low, but because your brain is tuned to it, she only, you know it only has to be on quite low, but you just hear the noise and you instantly know. Mm-hmm. It's not the volume, it's the, the noise or the type of noise that makes you sit up and take notice. So, so with that theory, not all alarms have to be really loud. So just thinking about, say, alarms in your house, a fire alarm, smoke alarm, something like that. Very, very noisy, isn't it? The one that I hear the most is the little beep for when you have to change the battery. Oh, that's so annoying. It's, it's the most obnoxious sound that I can think of. It's so loud. It interrupts anything. Is it the same as ours? Because we, we had I, one. I assume they're all the same. We, we just... had one that we couldn't find. <laughs> and it was so annoying because literally every sort of minute or so, it just go boop, like that. Yeah. Just this really piercing, just a single, very, very short, just a... you just like turning the house upside down going, where is it? Where is it? Yeah. it took us days to find it. All oh, right, okay. Days of oh, annoying us to find it. Interestingly, so there's some research though about how children for smoke alarms don't necessarily wake up. The frequency of them doesn't make them wake up. Really? Yeah. So research shows that actually the a human voice, a female human voice talking to them is the best thing to get them to wake up. Oh. 
Okay. So saying there is, there is a fire, get out, which I believe is why the nest smoke alarms talk to you. Have you got a nest smoke alarm? Yes, we do. Is that what, is that what happens? Have you ever tried it? It's never got to the point of, because you can silence it before it goes off, right? What, when you've got a, something in the oven for too long? Yeah, but it, but it's, but you know, so if something's been burnt in the kitchen or whatever, it will say there is smoke in the living room. The oh, alarm, really? The alarm will sound. The alarm is loud. And then obviously it gives you a couple of seconds to cancel it. Yeah. It's kind of nice in a way. It's preparing you for what's going to happen. Yeah. Okay, good. But we've never let it get that far because at that point, as long as you walk up to it and kind of tap it, it will then say alarm, silenced or whatever. Okay. Stops. Yeah. I, I think they've clearly thought a lot about the sound design in that product and thought about it in a different way to the traditional smoke alarms, which all just, just you know, go da 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 or whatever noise they make. And it tells you as well, actually, it says after the smoke dissipates, it goes, the smoke is clearing in the living room or whatever it says. It's quite good that you get that sort of feedback because you wouldn't get that from the traditional kind of smoke alarm where it either is going off or is not going off. I genuinely think the Nest smoke alarms are excellent. I mean, it's expensive. It's very expensive. But if you can afford them, I think they are They are a very well-designed product. And it's stamp of approval. A lot of alarms in hospitals are also just false alarms. So completely pointless, completely unnecessary for them to be even going off. So there's no wonder that people are ignoring them. And then that yeah. kind of means that they're crying wolf as well. So that when an alarm does go off that you need to pay attention to, somebody might not pay attention to it. So that's the that's the sound fatigue again. Yeah. Where if you hear too many blips and alerts and sirens and sounds and things like that, then you just get kind of immune to it. Can I tell you about a noise that annoys me and I find accidentally, like, I find startling often when I'm not expecting it? Please do tell me what startles you. In cars, right. the chime that some of them make when the low fuel light comes on. Right, okay. So you're happily driving along, minding right. your business, and then all of a sudden it just goes like, bong! And like, yeah. all, it's, all it's telling you is something quite insignificant, which is at some point in the next 70 miles, you might want to think about topping up with fuel, <laughs> which is not in any way urgent enough that I need to take my eyes off my off the road and look at it right, right, right this second. Yeah. And yet that noise is more than once in the past. I've been, you know, in the middle of navigating some quite difficult circumstance on the road. Yeah. And it's just bong. And I'm like, whoa, whoa what's happening? What's happening? What's happening? And like, it's so insignificant. It doesn't even matter. I know what you mean. And I've had a similar one, but it's the sound that happens when it thinks that somebody on the passenger seat hasn't got a seatbelt on. And what's happened is I've put some shopping down on my laptop or something like that, which normally is fine, but I don't know. Maybe I'm going around a corner and it thinks that there's someone sitting there, but they haven't got their seatbelt on. And then that makes it quite an alarming sound, which I'm then going, oh, what? What was that? And I'm like having to look around and that takes my eyes off the road, which is... Which is annoying. Yeah, I think I think what we're basically saying in summary to all of all this is that the warning sound has to be proportionate with the level of alert, right? Yeah. And we need to be smart about telling people, smart about using sounds in UX because if we do it too often, but it just melts into the background or startles people when it should when they shouldn't. So you have to be really careful about how you use sound. I think in a user experience. Yeah. True. True. Just on the last topic on on noise, we're both in the web industry, mm-hmm. and we haven't really said anything about how noise on noise on the web and whether you know notification sounds are good or bad. So the tr- traditional wisdom, I think you'll agree with me here, is that websites that make sound are <laughs> bad, pretty much universally. It used to be a thing. A lot of websites used to make sound. Yeah, right? so you remember days, like. In, in the, the early days, days of, the of well, I say the early days of the web. We'd, I'm talking, I don't know, I, I, 10, 20 years ago, maybe. That was fine when I was first learning web design as a sort of teenager. Yeah. I remember making my first GeoCities websites. Yeah. Did it have auto playing music? And I, mine did. I, yes, I remember being so proud of myself that I'd found out that MIDI was small enough that you could attach a MIDI file to a website. Yeah, MIDI And files. it would load quick enough on a modem, 56K modem, that you could have background music. And it was terrible. It was like horrible <laughs> synthesized. I had a horrible like the Benny Hill theme music <laughs> <laughs> on a website it was absolutely awful yeah. for no other reason for no other reason than you, you could, could. Yeah. I, I seem to remember somebody wanting one of my first web clients wanted Christmas music playing on their website at Christmas it was so bad awful so bad, so bad. but I don't think you should ever forcibly play music to people 
I agree with that, yeah, because say you've got loads of tabs open, you've opened some tabs, and then one of them starts playing music, you'd be like, oh, which one, which one is it? You've got to close it down. Oh, the, wor- the worst thing as well is that if you're in the middle of, this happens today actually, but if I'm on a, a web page and it's playing some video or some music and my laptop runs out of battery or I just decide to quickly close it because I'm finished, the next time you open it up, if it happens to be at work or in a quiet room, oh, yeah. and it suddenly starts blaring out again. That's that embarrassing. is embarrassing. Yeah. I'd... Especially if it is pornography. <laughs> I, I don't know what you mean, David. I don't know. I, d- I don't know what you mean. Um, I had to make a website fairly recently that the client wanted auto playing music as part of the experience. Recently, recently, yeah, and it was very difficult to explain to them that actually not not only that it's a bad idea, but it's impossible these days because well, browser makers obviously don't want people to be annoyed. Yeah. And so Chrome has a thing built in. Can't really speak about all the others, all the other browsers, but I know Chrome has a way of muting a tab. And you you can see it if you look at the top on the tab. It shows the speaker icon, which you can press to to completely mute. Oh, I didn't know that. If you couldn't find where it was on the page to to click to uh, mute the music. I didn't know you could click on it to mute it. That's really useful knowledge. Yeah, you can, yeah. They will also, if you as a web developer have have tried to create auto-playing music, they will just not play it unless you've interacted with that page first. Yeah. So like there's maybe a splash screen or something, a modal that says this will play some music. Do you want to accept it? Yes or no. If it knows that you've clicked on that page previously, then it will allow autoplay music to um, to play. But otherwise it just, it won't. It just refuses to, to do it. I think it's sensible as well. But this, but- this client, they were... They really wanted that sort of audio visual experience, and they wanted it as part of the of the brand. And so they were quite disappointed that they couldn't get what they wanted. We suggested that they could have a, a splash screen, which solves the problem, but no, it's just I, an extra extra click, isn't I it? I can't see many good reasons for having sound auto playing on the site. The the only thing I think that sound is useful on the web is when you're trying to create an app like experience, much like a mobile app. You need to notify someone that something's happened. Um, yeah. So like you're sending a message, you want to say that it's gone. Yeah, I spend. A lot of time on a forum that if I get um, someone replies to a message I've posted or someone sends me a personal message, I get a little ping, and I quite appreciate that actually. I, I like okay. the fact that, that it does that. It's okay, quite useful. So it is okay in some cases. Yeah, I think it's okay if you're providing a better experience, but I can't see auto playing music as ever being a better experience. It's someone trying to force their annoying branding on you. Well, think about this though: you're opening a new tab of a YouTube video. You want mm-hmm. that to auto play. Yeah, which it does. But the only, but the only, but the only like purpose that. of that web page yeah. is to play a video. Yeah, so and, 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 and it I is have, okay in context. I think yeah, that's what yes, I'm saying. Yeah, and I will have clicked on that link knowing that I'm expecting a video to play, yeah. right? That's fine. If I've gone to Google and searched for caravans and I click on a website about caravans... You're not expecting the caravan theme tune to suddenly start playing. Yeah, or do you remember <laughs> that amazing one from years ago? Oh my God, the but- was it a butcher's? Yes. And it was like meat, 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 meat. No, that's not right. Yeah, is it? that's yeah, that's is it. it. That is? Yeah, yeah. There's a website <laughs> that we once stumbled across. <gasps> that was fantastic for a butchers, and the, and it had this auto playing theme tune that went meat, 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 lovely meat. <laughs> no, it wasn't quite that. Was it? It wasn't quite that. It was meat, 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 lovely meats from wholesale meats. That's that it. it. That's it. Wholesale meats. Do they still exist because we've just given them some free advertising. This is a nice circular reference back to the start of the podcast when we were talking about radio jingles and how catchy, catchy they are. So they still exist, but only in Coventry. Oh, there's no music playing. Well, good. Oh, well, that makes me sad. They must have taken it off. Or has Chrome just banned it from playing? Maybe. They might sue us for butchering their theme tune. Butchering! They're about meat! <laughs> <laughs> what a pun. <laughs> Bad usability nightmares! Okay, so I've got a usability nightmare that relates to our last episode. We talked about self-checkouts in supermarkets. This is actually a long time ago, but I was reminded of it. And what happens if you go to a checkout, and this was in the Sainsbury's in town, and if you pay with a £20 note, for example, for a small amount of shopping, it gives you some change. But because mm-hmm. it's a it's a fairly large machine, and inside I don't know what the mechanics are doing, but I'm inserting a £20 note, and you insert it in this space at the side, and it kind of pulls in the note note it's quite eager to suck it in right and then it goes okay you've you've given me 20 pound i need to give you some change so it gives me some coins 
And coins sort of come out in a tray, sort of down at your kind of crotch level. Yeah. yeah. Right? And then that, it, all the coins come out there, like you've won on the... Um, Jack- jackpot. Jackpots. Yeah, ding, jackpot. Ding, 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 ding. ding. Okay, so you collect those. And then notes, like, so the £5 or £10 notes come out somewhere else, underneath. So they're in a place that you're not even looking. And I think it even says to you, notes are dispensed underneath the something. So you've got to look in a place. You've got to really sort of like crane your neck and have a look down and see where the notes are coming out because they're not coming out in a place that's similar to the other place. Oh, because your receipt comes out somewhere to the left. So you've got to check all these different places. Coins come out there. Coupons comes out there. Receipt comes out there. And your notes are like way below everything else. So you've got to really sort of bend down and have a look. And I was watching, uh, this is a long time ago. I was stood there with Zach and I was watching a lady do it. And, uh, and I was like saying to her, oh, it's ridiculous, isn't it? It's stupid that it works like this. Why can't they be more consistent about the places that the, that the change comes out so that they both come out of the same place so that you won't ever walk out without without the £10 note that it's just spat out? Because that happened to me once i did actually walk out and somebody chased me going you've left 10 pound it came out there you just didn't see it I was like, oh. so i said it was really stupid but the lady that i was watching who was using the self-checkout turned around she heard me say the word stupid and she's like are you calling me stupid you're calling me stupid and i was like no 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 i'm saying I'm, I'm talking about the usability of the machine she's like you're calling me stupid i'm not stupid i bet she wouldn't back down and i didn't know what to do i'm like terrible with confrontation <laughs> and I, I didn't I'd not said anything bad to her she just thought that I'd said something bad and how, it, it turned, how, it, turned how into a it, thing how was it resolved I can't remember now and she didn't punch me thankfully but uh, she was very angry Shall I share with you a nightmare? Yes, please. That I have had. So my nightmare is that the weekend we went to a, like a water park. Right, okay. Not not like a swimming pool, but with like slides and other activities that are kind of, it's not really for swimming, it's for splashing around and doing silly things. Right, okay. And there were three slides. You go to the top of these steps and then... Is this for kids or are you are you doing this as well? Yeah, we went as a family. Right, okay. So Hannah was busy with the, the little baby sort of doing some light splashing. Did you have your trunks on? I did have my (laughs) trunks on. I'm not, I don't expose myself in the pool Trunks or Speedos? Uh, Nobody needs to see you in Speedos. No, trunks. Trunks. I'm definitely a trunks kind of guy. Um, So yeah, they have these three slides. Now, two of them are quite fast. So my little girl who's only two and a bit can't go on them. Yeah. But there was a third slide, which was more tame. Right. From the same height, but obviously not as vicious in terms of the drop or or speed attained. Right. Okay. No risk of drowning. Well, of course there's a risk of drowning whenever there's water involved. But, you know. Hopefully hopefully not. I I was with her anyway, so... It's fine. So it's a, it's a wide slide. You know, normally like slides are like a half pipe shape, aren't they? Like yeah. A semicircle. Yeah. And they're only like one person wide. Yeah. Well, this one was more like a wide trough that was about three or four people wide. Imagine that. Okay. Right. But the weirdest thing is you sat in it and you first went down this kind of like drop and then flattened out. And then you would just come to a stop. What do you mean? On the water slide. What? Because you didn't have enough m- momentum? Yes. Why? I don't know. Are you wearing some super no, fiction shorts? Everyone was the same. So you, you need could, to like butter yourself up. Maybe. <laughs> you, you, could, you could stand there and watch other people on the slide doing exactly the same thing. And they'd, they'd go down the first bit of this drop and then it'd just go flat. And so they'd just come to a stop. And then and what like, do you do? Well, everyone just sort of stops. And if you could watch people that hadn't been on it before, it's so funny just watching them like, is it meant to do this? Oh, right. Am I meant to stop here? So then what people would do, myself included, and my little girl as well who was on it with me, you sort of had to bum shuffle yourself forwards. <laughs> bum shuffle? Yeah, with your hands. Like a, like a dog with worms. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Doing a bum shuffle forwards <laughs> to the next drop. Okay. <laughs> and then the same thing again. So there's this sort of like drop bit where it goes quite fast and you splash down at the bottom. Right. And then again, you sort of skid to a stop and then you got to bum shuffle. Maybe, maybe you're supposed to, I don't know be more aerodynamic on the on the drop bits maybe if you pull yourself tight and close you can get enough speed to drop down and then you'll you'll make it past the the flat bit no there's no way it's like okay you could maybe sort of streamline yourself and go and maybe wear low friction shorts or whatever you want to do you shave your legs like maybe, uh, swimmers do yeah Maybe lie flat, flat on your back to reduce drag. Maybe you could try something. Uh, maybe you would get sort of twice as far as I did. Maybe. Right. But that's still like not even half the distance you need to go between the drops. That's <laughs> silly. 
So I was trying to work out why. Like, the only thing I could think of is either it's, like, made, because it's wide and flat, for maybe a rubber ring. Maybe you're supposed to, like, be in a rubber ring. Oh, maybe, yeah. And maybe if you're in a rubber ring, that's a lot lower friction. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. But then the drops are kind of too steep for a rubber ring. Like, you'd it literally, like, turf you out. Like, yeah. So I can't imagine that. I don't know. So it was a poor user experience. Very poor user experience. Ada enjoyed it, though. I mean, it's her first water slide that she's Oh, well, on. she's got nothing to compare it to. Yeah. So it's going to be... The best water slide place that she's ever been on. Yeah. She also really liked it at that water park. They had a, a wave machine, which Ooh. was cool. In fact, that's an, an area as well where they used sound right. for the user experience. Wow. Well, what would happen is, because the wave machine wasn't always on, it was on sort of like for about five minutes every half an hour. And before it was about to come on, they sounded a siren like a wow, wow. Well, sounds a bit dramatic. Yeah, but and the light and a light would flash, like a sort of a strobing light would flash. Right, and that would go to red alert. And that would mean if you are interested in experiencing the wave machine, get in the get in that get, get in, in pool. that pool bit now, because, or get out. If or you... yeah, get out if you don't want it. And so what everyone would do is it's hilarious because people would be queuing up for the slides, and all of a sudden, people in the middle of a queue for a slide would go stuff this and they'd just like run back down the steps not, not interested in waiting for the slide anymore and right. just jump into the pool wow to they love the waves the waves instead yeah but anyway that that was my usability nightmare oh it's not really a nightmare is it you had a nice time you had a family had, day out it was quite embarrassing <laughs> bum shuffling on the slide <laughs> The, the worst bit, the worst bit that I didn't mention before. Yeah. As you're bum shuffling, you have to go past like the like the people on the stairs queuing for the other slides can watch you as you're bum shuffling, and it's really quite embarrassing. As like because you've chosen the fi- the slow slide, and they've chosen the really good, exciting one, and, and they're, they're like, laughing at you, and going, "I yeah. definitely made a good choice." Looking like a dog that's got worms, <laughs> like bum shuffling along. <laughs> So that's the end of the podcast. If you've seen or used something unusable recently, we want to hear about it. You can email us at podcast at theunusable.com and we're on Twitter at at unusablepodcast. I feel like there's a lot of ats in that sentence, by the way. Just go with it. If you've enjoyed this, and why wouldn't you? There's plenty more. The last episode we talked about online shopping and supermarket self-checkouts. And on YouTube, we've got a video of us talking about terrible laundry icons. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Music is by Gold5472. Please subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll get a notification about the next one. And that's it until next time. Goodbye. Bye.